Church, are you ready to receive the word this morning? We're going to cover some ground. So, yes, let us be ready. Let us be expectant. We have a, had a wonderful anointing sermon last week about hearing God's voice. And we anointed our ears to really incline our ears to His voice about what it is that He wants to say to us. And I felt in my heart really that this month we're going to press into this word about hearing and receiving from God. Why is that so important? Because you know all the anointing sermons that we had this, this um, and for those of you that, that miss maybe some of the anointing sermons, remember it is on our website at uh, www.kihilagroup.co.za, all the anointing sermons are there, and also at churchconnect.co.za. And we have had such wonderful anointing sermons of growing and advancing in Christ, of stepping into his likeness of what it is that he wants us for us and wants us to become. And the appearing and the demonstration and the revealing and the manifestation of Christ through us. And if we cannot hear from God, if there is blockages to hear from God, or if misperceptions about hearing from God, it's not much of a relationship, is it? Because one-way communication is not much of a relationship. And God is a relational God. That is why Jesus came, is to have relationship with us. And the kingdom is all about hearing and seeing, about God speaking, us responding, hearing the word and doing the word. The word is spirit and the word is life. I want you to turn your word to Matthew, um, Matthew 13, for those of you that have it here. We're going to read from the Amplified this morning. Um, and it is a very known scripture. It is this, the, the parable of the sower, which you so well know, right? But I want to point out something different in this parable this morning for you to hear. We're going to pick it up from verse 9, Matthew 13, verse 9. It says, He who has ears to hear, let him be listening, and let him consider and perceive and comprehend by hearing. The word says, faith comes by hearing. Say, so I have an ear to hear. Yes. Let him consider and perceive and comprehend by hearing. How do we comprehend? How do we perceive? How do we consider? By hearing. Hearing from God. Okay. Then it says, verse 10, Then the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he replied to them, To you, to you, the disciples, those who follow me, to you, the disciples, it has been given to know the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To you disciples that follow him. It has been given that you would know the secrets and the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it's not been given. For whoever has spiritual knowledge to him more be given and he will be furnished richly so that he will have abundance. But from him who has not even what he has will be taken away. Then Jesus says, this is the reason I speak to them in parables in verse 13. Because having the power of seeing, they do not see. And having the power of hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they grasp and understand. He explains it further in verse 15. It says, for the nation's heart has grown gross, fat and dull, and their ears heavy and difficult of hearing, and the eyes they have tightly closed, lest they see and perceive with their eyes, and they hear and comprehend the senses with their ears, and grasp and understand with their heart, and turn, and I should heal them. So he says that they cannot hear because their heart has grown fat and dull and grown gross. But to you, the secrets of the heaven has been given. And remember he says, though they have the power of seeing, they do not see. Though they have the power. Do we have power? Yes, we have the power. Whenever the word speaks about power, it speaks of the Holy Spirit. 
So we have the Holy Spirit, so we can see. We have the power, we have the Holy Spirit, so we can see. Verse 16, but blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied are your eyes because they do see. And your ears because they do hear. Say, I have an ear. I do hear. Verse 70, truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous men, men who were upright and in right standing with God, yearned to see what you see, and they did not see it. And to hear what you hear, and they did not hear it. Because Holy Spirit was given after. Okay. And this is the thing, is you have the ability to hear from God. You have the ability to hear His voice. And I know that some of you might think that, no, I don't really hear God. And this morning, as an entry point to this month that we're going to journey about hearing God's voice, I want to say to you that that is a myth and that is a fallacy because you hear God's voice. It has been given unto you. It has been, we have received this Holy Spirit and we're going to journey with that because last week we heard so eloquently that Christ is the Word, right? Christ is the living Word that came down, that dwelleth with us. He is the, the God that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. God is the spoken word in the beginning in Genesis 1. God spoke and it was. So there is a living word, Jesus, that came and dwelt. There is a spoken word which God, by which God created. And then there's a written word. And the written word, what the word says about the written word, you can find in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17. It says, listen, every scripture is God breathed, given by inspiration and profitable for instruction, for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction and error and discipline in obedience, for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose, and action. So that the man of God, the woman of God, may be proficient, complete, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped in every good work. Amen. The scriptures are God breathed and they speak to us. And He is the Word, the living Word, the spoken Word, the written Word. He is the Word. And the purpose of the Word last week, Pastor Alma so eloquently taught us, is to communicate. Word is to communicate, is to have fellowship, to have conversation. So. I thank Janine for preparing this corner for us in this month, for a reminder, for a reminder that God wants to sit with you. He wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to communicate with you. Will you sit down with him and hear from him? I once got a word, a prophetic word, and it was a hard word for me. It says, Bets, you are too hasty. God is speaking to you all the time, but you cannot hear him. You're in a hurry always. You're always busy. And I had to train by, by his grace, by his spirit. I had to train my spirit to go and sit down. To position myself to hear from him. And I want to ask you this morning, will you sit down with him? Will you incline your ear, like Isaiah says in Isaiah 55 verse 3, says, incline your ear, submit, and consent to the divine will. And come to me here, and your soul will be revived. This is how our soul is revived, is to sit with him and to hear from him and to spend time with him and to hear from God. So I want to ask you this morning, when Janine walked in this morning, she said, oh, I'm going to take away that white basket because there's nothing in the basket. I said, no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Because you know the in and out basket. Um, what is the question in your heart this morning? What is the thing, if you imagine now at 11 o'clock, you have tea time with God. You know, when you go to a friend, you've got, you've been invited for tea. What is the question in your heart? What is the thing you would like to ask? 
You know, when we go to a friend, we know, oh, we're going to ask them about this and that that happened. We're going to tell them about this and that, and we're going to ask them or remind them about or whatever. What is the thing in your heart that if you have tea time at 11 o'clock with God this morning, what is the question or the thing that you would want to ask him? What's in your basket? What would you bring? And I want you to think about that. God wants to hear from you. And we're going to, this morning, dwell on this topic and, and, and how, how I feel, I want to phrase it, is to discern to hear His voice. To discern to hear His voice. And before we go into the real message of today, I want to just address a myth. Because some of us think that God speaks to Bates. God speaks to Vilti. God speaks to you now. God doesn't speak to me. And some of us, when we share our testimonies, we would say, and God said to me, and then God sent me, and then this is what I heard from him. And people look at you and they think, oh my goodness, you must be super blessed or holy, or uh, you've got a direct line. And you immediately in that thought, you discard yourself. Okay? You say, um, you, know, you guys are next level. I'm just on ground zero. And I want to address that because it is a myth. It is a lie from the enemy. God has given us all the ability to hear from him. And I want you to follow the word. Follow the word. Follow Jesus. Follow the word. Follow his word. Follow me this morning as we go through these scriptures. The word says... That when we call upon the Lord, we are saved. Right, saints? When we call upon the word of the Lord, we are saved. The name of the Lord, we are saved. This it says in Acts 2 verse 21, it says, Whoever shall come upon the name of the Lord, invoking, adoring, and worshiping the Lord Christ, shall be saved. So when you call unto him, you are saved. Then it says in John 1, 12, it says, When you are saved, you have received the right, the privilege to become a child of God. Okay, follow, follow the word. It says in John 1, 12. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, the power, the privilege, the right to become children of God. Okay? When we have received that right, that privilege, Holy Spirit, the word says, Holy Spirit testify with our spirit that we are children of God. This we read from Romans 8 verse 16. We, we're going to refer to a few verses in Romans 8, so maybe you can actually open your word there if you want to. And the other one we're going to refer to a bit is uh, John 16. If you want to open, you can go to Romans 8 and John 16. So in Romans 8, 16, it says, The Spirit himself testify together with our spirit, Assuring us that we are children of God. So if you say, I am a child of God, it is Holy Spirit testifying with your spirit that you are a child of God. And just in that, you can know that you have the Holy Spirit. Because if you could not say, I'm a child of God, you don't have Holy Spirit. Because the word says, Holy Spirit testifies together with our own spirit that we are children of God, right? Right, amen. So, follow me, follow the word. It says in Romans 8, 9, if you just go up a few verses to verse 9, it says that Holy Spirit is in us, right? And when we receive the Holy Spirit, we become a child of God, like I said. It says in Romans 8, I'm going to pick it up from yeah, let's read the whole thing. But you are not living the life of the flesh. You are living the life of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that really dwells within you, directs you, and control you. Now listen. But if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He does not belong to Christ and is not truly a child of God. So it says to us that if we are a child of God, we have received the Holy Spirit. Right? Okay, so, Holy Spirit is in us. He testifies that we are children of God. And Holy Spirit, it, it, 
the word talks about he's the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive, but we know and recognize him because he lives within us and he's constantly with us. Now, we celebrate that Ascension Day on Thursday when Jesus went up. And this is what Jesus said. You can, you can maybe go to John 16, um, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. He said, However, I'm telling you nothing but the truth when I say, It is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, the counselor, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. So the Holy Spirit is in you. You've received him as a child of God and he wants to have close fellowship with you. And since he is in us, we live and we move and we are governed by the Holy Spirit. Because this is what Romans 8, 4 says. We who live and move, not in the ways of the flesh, but in the ways of the Spirit, who lives, who our lives is governed not by the standards and according to the dictates of the flesh, but it is controlled by the Spirit. So what, where are we going with this? What I'm saying to you is that when you become a child of God, you're no longer dictated by the flesh, but by the, Holy, by, but by the Holy Spirit. Because his word says also in Romans 8.14 that those led by the Spirit are sons of God. So we've got the Holy Spirit. And you can hear his voice because he is within you and he wants to have close fellowship with you. I want to ask you, in, just for us here, who have heard God speaking audibly to them in their lives? Who was as privileged to hear God speaking to me audibly? Three of this congregation. Now, for those of you that's got your hands up, who have heard God speaking audibly more than three times? Okay, so it does happen, but it doesn't happen often. Okay? Okay? Specifically, I heard God audibly two times in my life, and it was, I heard my name called Betsy, Betsy. And I heard it when I, not so long ago, it's a testimony for another day, when I was called twice. That's all. So how do I, I testify that I hear, and God said, and God, I'm one of the people that testifies about how God leads me, so how does he then speak to me? Who of you have heard uh, dreams from God? God has spoken to you in dreams, showed you dreams. Okay, a few more. How many can distinctly, keep your, eyes, your hands up, how many can distinctly remember vividly what dreams said? You can recall more than 10 dreams. Three out of a whole congregation. So God speaks to us in our lifetime, eh? In our lifetime. Some people have, cannot recall more than 10 vivid dreams that God's given them. Okay? It's just to, to elaborate a point. How many of you have been privileged to receive prophetic word over your, over your life? Prophetic word. Okay? More than 10. More than 10 prophetic words. Few. Five of us. So what I'm saying is that... This happens, but we are, why are we always thinking that God should speak supernaturally to us? And if he doesn't speak supernaturally to us, he doesn't speak to us. Because that is a, that is a fallacy, that is a myth. Yes, he does that, but it is not how it works ordinary. So God speaks to us in the ordinary. But when you obey and you listen his vo to his voice... Something extraordinary is happening in your life. Then you will see the extraordinary. So I just want to say to you that it is a myth that God only speaks to the elect and the chosen and to the, the pastors and the preachers and the evangelists. No, God speaks to you individually and you have the ability to hear his voice. So then what, how does the word say, how does God speak then? 
And I want you uh, to really underline the scripture in your, it's Romans 9 verse 1. It's a key scripture, I believe, for us to grasp and understand. It says, Romans 9 verse 1, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience, enlightened and prompted by the Holy Spirit, bearing witness with me. Where does Holy Spirit speak? Conscience, in my conscience. Where does Holy Spirit enlighten me and prompt me? In my conscience. What is a conscience? What is a conscience? Well, conscience is your inner man, right? Conscience is the inner voice. It's the God type of life. In the Webster Dictionary, conscience definition of conscience is the conformity to what one considers to be correct, right, and of moral good and are morally good. In other words, conscience is the discernment between what is right and what is wrong. How many of you know when you go into a building, something's off here? You can sense it. You, you just know something's off. Don't know what it is. How many in a conversation when you start, you know, don't go there? How many of you would feel, don't go there? So, this is what I want to encourage you with today, is to develop that and go with that. Because Holy Spirit speaks to our conscience. And He has given us all a conscience to know a discernment between what is right and what is wrong. Now the concordance says, in the, in the Greek it says, conscience is to understand, to become aware, to know and to consider. Be still and know. So I know we've got language to say, God said, God showed me, God warned me. But what we are actually saying is, I sense, I became aware of, God revealed to me a deeper understanding of. This is you are sensing all the time. He's speaking to you in the inner voice. And we must start to exercise that. Discernment in the dictionary says discernment is discernment between what is good and evil, right and wrong. In the word it says blessing and calamity, what will lead you to blessing and what will lead you to calamity, and to discern what is true and what is false. So he bears witness, this Romans 9 verse 1 says, he bears witness with my conscience, enlightening me, illuminate me, and prompting me to know. What is good, what is evil, what is right, what is wrong, what is truth, what is false, what is blessing, what is curse. And he will lead you continually. How do we know this? John 16, if your word is still open there in John 16 verse 13. Key compass scripture. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth giving spirit comes... Have you received the Holy Spirit? If you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. He comes. He will guide you into all the truth. Some truth? No, the word says all the truth. The whole truth, the full truth. And he will not speak his own message from his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from Father. He will give the message that has been given to him. And he will announce and declare to you, to you, he will declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. If you don't know, I don't know, Lord, this business decision, what way to go, what should I do, what must I consider, why is this happening? He will reveal it to you. And yes, you can come to the preachers and the pastors and you can come to the godly counselors and say, pray with me. And please go to those people that have the Holy Spirit to press in with you. But he will reveal it to you because you've got the Holy Spirit, right? So I want to say to you that there is a distinct difference between the old covenant 
and the new covenant. And we've got to understand the volume of this book. We've got to understand. Sometimes we read some things out of context. You know, way back when in church history, the, the general citizen was not allowed to have a, a Bible. It was only the priests. And they, if they had to want to hear from the Lord, they had to go to the priest, and the priest would interpret to them and give them the scriptures. And I understand why they did it. There was a good reason for it, because if you don't understand the volume of the book, you can really, you really make damage in the kingdom, right? But today we are privileged that we have the, the book. We have the book of life. And we must read the volume of the book, and we understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant when we read this, right? So in the Old Covenant, you know, when Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree of, who can remember, good and evil. And you know what happened there? There was a confusion between what is good and what is evil. The, the conscience got mixed up a bit in the paradise, okay? They ate from the tree of good and evil. And eventually, you would remember when God gave the law, people could not discern what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong. So eventually, God gave them the law. And remember also when they received the law, they, they said to Moses, you go and speak to God. Whatever you, he says to you, we will do. But you talk to him. So they actually removed themselves from the presence of the Lord. And that is why in the Old Covenant or Old Testament, the people needed to be reminded what is right and wrong by reading the law. So every now and then, they, someone had to read them the law, or God had to send a prophet or a priest to remind them what is right and what is wrong. And that is why God said to, they, said to us, but there is now a better covenant, a more excellent covenant. Okay, let's read about that in Hebrews 6. You can open your word in Hebrews 6. Um, from... Oh, sorry, it's Hebrews 8, verse 6. It says, But now, but as it now is, he, the Christ, has acquired for a priestly ministry, which is much superior and more excellent as the old covenant and the agreement. It says in verse 7b, And then God says, Behold, the days will come, says the Lord, when I will make and ratify a new covenant or agreement with the house of Israel. Verse 10. For this is the covenant, the new covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my laws upon their minds, even upon their innermost thoughts and understanding, and engrave them upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 11, key scripture, 11. And, I, and it will never more be necessary for each one to teach his neighbor and his fellow citizen, or each one his brother, saying, No, perceive, have the knowledge of, and get acquaintance by experience with the Lord. For all will know me, from the smallest to the greatest will know me. I will imprint. So you don't need someone to tell you what is right and what is wrong. God has imprinted that on your heart. He's giving you a sensing for that. Holy Spirit is within you. And you need to just practice to go with that. In 1 John, the same scripture is, is sort of repeating in 1 John 2 verse 20. It says, but you have been anointed why you hold a sacred appointment from you have been given an unction from the Holy One, and you all know the truth, or you know all things. So you might think, I don't know, and you might think you don't hear, and you might think someone else is more special, but that's a lie, because the Word says you will know the truth, and you will know all things. 1 John 2.26 2.27 says, and listen to this, this is beautiful. But as for you, the anointing, the sacred appointment, the unction, which you receive from him, abides permanently in you. So then you have no need that anyone should instruct you. But just as his anointing teaches you concerning everything, 
and is true and is no falsehood. So you must abide and live in never depart from him, being rooted in him, knitted to him, just as his anointing taught you to do. It's referencing John 15 then to abide in the vine. So the scripture is saying you, he will teach you concerning everything. Holy Spirit will teach you in all things and in all truth. It is just for us to practice, to practice. So you might think that some people have a direct line to God. The reality is they have just done more practicing. You know, when I cannot do this, I need to see now. I, I, I would need some practicing. And it's the same in the spirit. The word says, to, <laughs> yeah, the word says, physical training is of some value. <laughs> it's useful for a little, but godliness, spiritual training is useful and value in everything and in every way. For it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life which is to come. So we need to practice to go with our sensing, to go with the knowing, to go with what you know God is saying to you. And not to question that. Listen to this. Hebrews 5 verse 14 it says, But solid food is for full grown men, for those whose senses and mental, mental fac faculties are trained by practice to discriminate and distinguish between what is morally good and noble and what is evil and contradictory either to the divine of human law. So full-grown men comes from training and practicing senses and mental faculties. Senses and mental faculties. Anna sp spoke about the renewal of the mind. That's the only way that transformation comes, is by the renewal of the mind. Training your mental faculties. Sensing, going with your sensing. And I just want to say to you, I've once heard really good advice, and I want to give it to you this morning, and this is for extra. But when you sense, when you hear, go with that first prompting, because that first prompting is often the most purest form of Holy Spirit speaking to you. Something happens when you receive it in your spirit to when you think about in your mind. Something happens from year to year. All your mind says is, the voice in your mind says, really? No. Can that be? Go with the first prompting, because that is the most purest prompting from the Holy Spirit. Pastor Almaski's scriptures of last week um, was, follow me. Eh? It was John 10, 27. The sheep are my own. They hear and are listening to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We are his own. We are people of his pasture. We are people, his flock. He's not going to lead you to a place which is not good for you. Wherever he leads you is advantageous and beneficial to you. It says, my own hear. Saints, you can hear. It says, and are listening. Do you hear the progressive, the active progressive tense? And are listening. It is constantly, they are listening to my voice. And I know them. He knows you more than what you know yourself. He's designed you. He is the user manual. He knows exactly. And they will follow me. This John 10 verse 5 says, they will never on any account follow a stranger, but will run away from him because they do not know the voice of a stranger. They won't recognize their call. Listen, I want to say to you, the word says you will run from the voice of a stranger. Now, our problem is sometimes we follow that voice, never mind running from it. The voice says run from that voice. The stranger's voice. Now, we've got many voices in our lives. You know, we've got our own desires and our own needs that speaks to us. What do I want? What do I think will give me joy? What is it that I really think in my life? When I have it, I will be happy. 
the idols, the things that's more important than God, in our hearts. We've got idols in our hearts that we must deal with. We've got other people's needs and wants. Your children want, your, your friend perceive, your friend have an opinion, your mom has got an expectation, or your father has got an expectation. You've got voices of, of circumstance. Circumstance happens, and it says to you, you can't. You can, or you can't. There's voices of money. There's voices of religion. The shoots, and what you should be, and how you should measure up, and why you don't measure up. There's society and moral laws that speak. There is your place of work that speaks. There's so many voices. But in the midst of all of this, we have to just break for tea with the Lord and say, Lord, so what do you say about all of this? What is it that you say? And then we must hear, we must listen, and we must follow that prompting. So it is about sharpening our discernment. What is his voice? What is not his voice? And sometimes it is good to, to, to know what his voice does not sound like. What is the voice of the stranger? Just so that you can recognize the voice of the stranger and you can flee from it. Because the word says, test the spirits. The word says in 1 John 4 verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not put faith in every spirit, but prove and test the spirits to discover whether they proceed from God. Okay? So test the spirit. Test the voices. Now, last week something was said in the sermon that really struck me, and I thought I must, we must journey on this more. Because it's not about what the words have been said, but it's the spirit behind the words. It is the intention and the motive behind the word. Because sometimes the words can actually sound very noble and right, but it's not right. It's from the wrong spirit. We've got an example of, I think the best example in the word is um, Peter in Matthew 16. Um, let me see if I can quickly get, get to Matthew 16. You know, verse 13. Jesus went into the region of Caesarea and Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they answered him, some say John the Baptist, other Elijah, and others Jeremiah. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon P P Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood of men have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So, the Holy Spirit was behind that. It was God's voice that said, this is my son. Now just five verses further, 21. From the time forth, Jesus began clearly to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the high priests. Verse 22. Then Peter took him aside to speak to him privately and began to reprove and charge him sharply, saying, God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned away from Peter and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. So in an instance, you can hear a voice that is from God. And the next moment, Jesus said, Peter, that one you didn't get from God. You got it from Satan. And we must have the ability to discern what is the spirit behind this. Is it from God or is it from Satan? Is it from him or is it not from him? And even though there's many voices in our lives, we can, have, we can hear voices, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some voices. They all just come from one of two sources, either from God or not from God. Okay? So there's many voices, but the bottom line is, is it from God or is it not from God? If it's from God, we follow. If it's from the enemy, we run. We run. This is what the word says. So the voices, there's many voices that can speak. And we know, and I'm going to just quickly press in some of the voices of the enemy, right? He's the father of lies. This we know. He's known as the father of lies, lies in John 8, uh, 44. But sometimes he doesn't come to you with a lust, outright lie. He comes to you with a piece of scripture. It comes to you with truth. 
a twisted truth. Because remember when Jesus was tempted in the desert, Satan came to him and said, it is written. He quoted the scriptures. He didn't come to him with a lie. He came to him with truth. Okay? So we must really ask God to just show us, is this from him? Is this not from him? And then there's the spirit of deception. The Satan sometimes just come in and just put a seed of doubt. Doubt. Just a little like um, in, the, in the garden, I think, is a very good example. In Genesis 3, 1, the serpent was more subtle and crafty than any living creature in the field which the Lord had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God said? You know that voice that says to you, really? Sure. Yeah, sure. Did you, re- did you hear right? Now, if that voice comes up, it is not a voice from God. Because doubt does not come from God. His word, say his word, will never contradict his will. His word would not contradict his will. So if you've got a seed of doubt, a seed of mistrust, it's not his voice. Then we've got a voice or a spirit of religion. You know, the, 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 the voice that always tells you how to be a good Christian. A Christian, or a good father, or a good mother. And that voice keeps you busy with all the rituals. What you should, and it keeps you so busy with rituals, it keeps you from the relationship. It's where we are into churchianity instead of Christianity. We're so busy doing the right thing, but it is keeping you from the relationship, from the conversation. It's keeping you busy with all the peripherals. That voice is not from God. Listen to what the word says about hypocrites, and hypocrites is um, really the spirit of religion, right? In 1 Timothy 4 it says, But the Holy Spirit distinctly and expressly declare that in the latter times some will turn away from the faith, giving attention to deluding and seducing spirits and doctrines that demons teach. Through the hypocrisy and pretensions of liars whose conscience are seared. You know, when your conscience are seared, what really happens? And we miss a warning for all of us. It is when you ignore that prompting. You ignore the prompting. You actually know. You actually sense. But you don't go with that voice. You go with a contrary voice. And then the word says, what happens is after you have quenched the spirit, Spirit will always prompt. And after you have quenched the spirit, your conscience becomes seared. It's burned. It's like calloused. And the word says that has got a blinding effect on you. It blinds you for the truth. This is the next voice. Is a, is a voice of unbelief or a voice, yeah, a voice or a spirit of unbelief. It says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 to 5, the God of this world has blinded, the God of the world is Satan, right? Has blinded the unbelievers' mind that they should not discern the truth, preventing them from seeing the illumination light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image and likeness of God. So unbelief blinds you. Unbelief blinds you. And that, that voice, that spirit is not from God. There's a spirit of guilt and condemnation because we know that Satan is the accuser, and he always accuses the brethren. In Revelation 12.10, we read about it. The accuser of our brethren, who keeps on bringing before our God charges against them day and night. <sighs> day and night. A voice is accusing you. It's opposing you. It's coming against you. And that voice is not the voice from God. Do you know the voice that says, oh, you're not a good mother? Will a good father do that? Oh, you're not much of a friend, eh? How could you do that? What were you thinking? That voice is not a voice from God. Speak about another voice. It's a voice of envy and jealousy. (sighs) Envy and jealousy. It says in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 2, it says, For as long as there's envying and jealousy and wrangling, that is a long debate, conflict. Envy and jealousy and wrangling and factions amongst you, you are Are you not unspiritual and of the flesh? 
behaving yourselves after human standards and unchanged men. If, you, if there's envy and jealousy, you are unspiritual. It means the spirit does not dwell there. No place for the spirit in that. The voice of contention, the next voice, the voice of contention or bitterness, rivalry, and self-ambition. In James 3, verse 16, 14 to 16, it says, But if you have bitter jealousy, envy, and contention, contention is rivalry, rivalry self-ambition, self-interest, self-justification. Listen, if you're in a place where you want to explain yourself, you're not in the spirit. You want to justify yourself, you're not in the spirit. If you're at a place of envy and contention, rival self-ambition in your hearts, do not pride yourselves on it and thus be in defiance of and false to the truth. This superficial wisdom, you know, of self-right, self-justification, self-ambition, this superficial wisdom is not as such as it comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual. Well, it's actually says it's animal even devilish and demonical. For wherever there is jealousy, envy, contention, rivalry, and self-ambition, there will also be confusion. There will be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. So when you hear a voice of contention, of self-ambition, of confusion, it is not the voice of God. Okay? And I can go on, there's many. Voice of fear, spirit of fear, voice of pride, spirit of pride. And you know, when we pray and we trust the Lord to show us discerning of spirits, and, we, and the God says, yeah, this is a, a spirit of jealousy, or this is a voice of fear, or this is a, we can name it. It's not always like that. Sometimes you can walk into a building, like I said, you can just know something is off here. Yeah. You don't have a name for it. And sometimes it doesn't matter that you don't have a name because if, it, if the source is either from God or it's not from God. If it's from God, we follow. If it's not from God, we flee. We run from it. And this is how we discern when God is speaking to us and not. And we're going to journey with this more practically this month as to how to hear and what is the blockages to hear from God. But I want to encourage you this morning that you can hear from God. And the word actually teaches us, and I'm going to close with that, and um, maybe the worship team can also come up. But I'm going to encourage you just with a few things quickly about what is then the voice of God. And we actually know whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, right? Philippians says. But 1 John 4, verse 1 to 2 says the following. It says, Beloved, do not put your faith in every spirit, but prove and test the spirit to discover whether they proceed from God. For many false prophets have gone into the world. And then it says, how you discern the false prophets. It says, by this you may know, perceive, and recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit which acknowledge and confess the fact that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, actually has come, become man, and has dwelt in the flesh, has God for its source. So in the first place, if that voice does not acknowledge Jesus, it's not a voice from God. Okay? Further in that same chapter, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. Love springs from God, and he who loves his fellow man is begotten from and born of God. And is becoming progressively to know and understand God, to perceive and recognize and get a better, clearer knowledge of Him. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know Him, because God is love. So if Jesus is not behind that voice, it's not a God from God. If love is not behind, if the essence, if the motive, if the essential is not born in love. It's not of God. It's got self-interest or it's got any other motive. It's not of God. And then it says in James 3 verse 17, it says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is undefiled. Then it is peace-loving. It's courteous. It's considerate. It's gentle. 
It's willing to yield to reason. You know where you say, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. No. The word says it yields to reason. It's full of compassion and good fruits. And the word also, by the way, says you will know a false prophet from his fruits. Fruits is the fruits of the Spirit. Love, gentleness, kindness, forbearance, long-suffering. It says it is willing to yield to reason, to reason, full of compassion and good fruits. It is wholehearted and straightforward. <laughs> wholehearted and straightforward. It means it's authentic, it's real. It's impartial, doesn't take sides. It's unfeigned. It's free of doubts, free of wavering, free of sincerity, insincerity. And this is what, when we know, well, this is of God. And so this is really my prayer. And we're going to close off, and I'm going to give you some time to just come and sit with God, right? And before we do that, um, I'm also blessing this offering and I'm also blessing for what you have prepared and, and come and sowed into this morning. And may a big harvest come up for you in terms of that. But this morning, when you, when you come up to sow or where you sit, I just want to invite you to come and sit with God and say to God, God, this question, this thing, that is in my heart. This thing that I want to ask you. Get clarity of. Get understanding of. How long, Lord? Some of you, I'm hearing, I'm hearing in the spirit. Some of your question is, how long, Lord? How long, Lord? What is the question that is in your heart? What is the thing that you yearn to long for? Long, I, Lord, I've been standing, I've been waiting, I've, I'm, I'm, I've been asking, but I'm still unsure. I'm still unsure. I don't know. What is in your basket this morning? And when you come and you say to the Lord, well, what I know is I know what is not of you. And from that voices, from those voices, I'm going to flee. But Lord, I'm going to position myself to hear from you. I'm going to position myself to incline my ear. Will you whisper in my heart? Will you whisper in my heart this morning what you want me to see, become aware of? Speak to my conscience. What is it that you want me to see in my basket? And then we wait. And we trust the Lord. That first thing, that first thing that pop up like toast, you know? I was sitting quietly with the Lord and then all of a sudden, I think about Petra. I'm like, Lord, it's the unction of the Spirit saying, you need to intercede for Petra. I will sit quietly with the Lord and something will pop up in my spirit and I would know the scripture. You will remind me of the scripture. Sometimes you will look at a painting. Tell me, what do you see if you look at a painting? Because I tell you what, what I see is not what you're going to see. Because God speaks to you individually. And he wants you to become aware of something. I will sit there and I will become aware of the cushion. And some of us will see the flowers and some of us will see the pink. Because there's something God wants you to become aware of. And then you go with that. Say, Lord, what is it about the pink that you want to reveal to me? Maybe he says to you, I just want to, to remind you this morning that I love you. What a perfect love. Whatever it is. So I want to encourage you as we close now and you come up with your offering, you are welcome to go and spend as much time here as you want to. Just to sit with the Lord. And just to trust him for that first thing, for that first prompting that is in your in basket this morning. Shall we do that? Let me close and then you are welcome to flow freely. Lord, this morning we come to you. We come to you as your sons and your daughters. Oh, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that that is 
the new covenant, the promise that we have received is your spirit that will guide us in all truth, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you lead us and that you show us and that you speak to us always. Thank you, Lord, this morning that we know that you speak to our conscience. You, 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 you speak to our awareness level. And thank you this morning that we are sensitive for this so that we can know and recognize and perceive you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we will flee from what is not your voice. But we will incline our ear. We will consult with you because, Holy Spirit, you are the counselor. You are the strengthener. You are our support. Thank you, Lord, that you are the comforter. And we can come to you like a friend that wants to have deep and intimate fellowship with you and we can abide. We can abide in you. Thank you, Lord, that we can go out this morning. And if I have to ask this question in this congregation, but who can testify by the raising of your hand that God is speaking to you in the spirit, in sensing, in perceiving, in discerning of the inner, of the inner voice, of the inner man, that all of us, without any doubt we'll be able to raise a hand and say yes he speaks to me thank you Lord that we want to train our spirit to do more and more of that we do not want to become calloused or hard hardened our conscience we don't want to sear our conscience no thank you for raising our awareness levels in Jesus name we thank you that this month Lord we will dedicate our ears to hear from you because faith comes from hearing and when we hear the whispers of Holy Spirit we will see extraordinary things in our life manifesting we will hear in the spirit but we will see in the physical Amen